Probably the greatest harm done by vast wealth is the harm that we of moderate means do ourselves when we let the vices of envy and hatred enter deep into our own natures. In early 2019, Oxfam reported that the world's 26 richest people own as much wealth as the poorest 3.8 billion people who make up half the population of this planet. Ten months later, nothing much has changed, except that the rich have been getting richer more quickly. New data shows that the wealth of the top 1% has grown 100 times faster than the bottom 50% since 1970. In 2018, billionaires grew their combined wealth by 2.5 billion US dollars a day, while the poorest 3.8 billion people lost 500 million dollars a day. As Seth Michaels of the Union of Concerned Scientists said, the bulk of a generation of economic growth has been captured and concentrated in a few hands, and many people have barely seen any of it. It's no longer possible to argue that a rising tide lifts all boats. The economic growth model that advantages the few clearly is not helping the people at the bottom. Actually, it's doing the opposite. The situation would be better described as a mountain with a few rich people on top who have access to large drinking straws. As they drink more water, the tide lowers for all the poor people down below. The rich-poor gap is widening, and in 2019, something had to give. Bring in Exhibit 1 – Global Unrest Mass protests have been springing up across the globe. In Europe, France is crippled by another day of disruption and protests over major changes to the pension system planned by the French government. Spain has been racked with violent protests as Catalan separatists took to the streets after Spain's Supreme Court jailed nine separatist leaders. Eastern European countries such as Hungary and Poland are sliding slowly towards authoritarianism, with protests breaking out across their countries. In Hungary, the government are planning to tighten their control over theatres, with protesters denouncing this as an attack on artistic freedom. Doesn't that set off alarm bells here in Australia? Prime Minister Scott Morrison has recently erased the word arts from the Department of Communications and the Arts, claiming it's been incorporated into another department. Not to mention the federal police raids that were conducted on journalists throughout the year. Be warned, this is how all authoritarian regimes begin. Chip away at our freedoms until, before you know it, we have little to none left. In Latin America, protests have erupted across multiple countries, with Latin American democracy clearly in trouble. There has been unrest in Chile, where a student protest over a spike in subway fares in October turned into essentially a mass riot. The rich and powerful threw the first stone. In Bolivia, long-serving populist president Evo Morales was forced out of office and has since fled the country. Protests and riots are ongoing. Venezuela is in a complete mess. 4.6 million people have already fled the country as violence, political corruption, unemployment, human rights violations, and chronic food and medical shortages have all become daily occurrences. Violent clashes have also broken out in Ecuador, Peru, and Haiti, just to name a few more. In the Middle East, a similar story has unfolded. Protests have broken out in Lebanon over rising living costs, lack of job opportunities, stagnant wages, and corruption. Protesters in Iran were brutally put down, with between 200 to 1,000 people being shot by security forces, with thousands more arrested. The corrupt Iranian government are clearly willing to use any means necessary to maintain political and social control. Iraq is not faring any better. Anti-government protests have erupted on a regular basis, with scores of people being attacked or shot at for participating in the protests. Libya is racked by civil war, with refugees flooding across the Mediterranean, primarily to Italy. The Egyptian economy is doing a lot better than its citizens, with many Egyptians living in poverty. Jordan has also experienced protests this year, with many of the population angry over falling living conditions and widespread unemployment. I could go on. Russia, Hong Kong, South Africa… but I think you get the picture. The citizens of the world are fed up. They're fed up with the rich and powerful robbing them of their livelihoods and their freedoms. It was only a matter of time before people started to stand up, and once it started to happen, it spread like wildfire. Associate Professor Henry Carey of Georgia State University wrote on these issues in the magazine The National Interest. He wrote, 
Each protest in this worldwide wave has its own local dynamic and cause, but they also share certain characteristics — fed up with rising inequality, corruption and slow economic growth, angry citizens worldwide are demanding an end to corruption and the restoration of the democratic rule of law. Ignored by the municipal government, overcrowded urban settlements usually lack sanitation, clean drinking water, electricity, healthcare facilities and schools. The injustices of this daily life underlie the anger of many of today's protesters. From Quito to Beirut, extreme marginalization of so many people living in big dysfunctional and dangerous places has boiled over into deadly unrest. Exhibit 2 — Climate Change No matter what you think of the climate movement, or whether you believe in human-caused climate change or not — I'm not here to convince you either way — one thing that is certain is that the climate is changing and has become a major cause of global unrest. Unless you've had your head buried in the sand, Australia is burning, and people have had enough. Hundreds of families have lost their homes, cities are choked with smoke, and the Australian government seem to be in complete denial. Our intrepid leader, Scott Morrison, has rejected any calls for more bushfire assistance. Despite volunteer firefighters being completely exhausted and having spent weeks away from their normal employment, many without pay, Mr Morrison commented, the fact is, these crews, yes, they're tired, but they also want to be out there defending their communities. We're constantly looking at ways to better facilitate the volunteer effort, but to professionalise that at that scale is not a matter that has previously been accepted, and it's not currently under consideration by the government. In other words, exhausted volunteers who are trying to save our communities from burning down don't deserve any pay, because they want to be there. Apparently, they don't even deserve face masks, food, or water, with the New South Wales Rural Fire Brigade having to resort to crowdfunding to buy essential equipment. Thanks Mr Morrison, your leadership is much appreciated. As I said, whether or not human-caused climate change is to blame, the Australian government, and many governments around the world, are seen as being indifferent to climate concerns, which means they're seen as ignoring their citizens, which is never a good thing to do when you're trying to run a country. But despite the Liberal Party's rhetoric, two of its MPs have actually publicly linked the ongoing bushfires to climate change. New South Wales Environment Minister Matt Keane and Federal Minister Suzanne Lee have both admitted that they believe in climate science, with Mr Keane saying that, "...we have to do our bit to abate carbon and reduce the impact of climate change." and Ms Lee stating, "...the dryness of the vegetation, particularly in the north of New South Wales, and the reduced stream flow is creating unprecedented conditions. That's what climate science has told me, and I completely agree with it." Anyway, people are angry. Climate protests are occurring across the world. The rise of groups like Extinction Rebellion are just indicative of the growing number of people concerned with climate and the environment, and the negative effects that humans have on it. Exhibit 3 — America's Retreat America is slowly retreating from its traditional role as a stabilising force. The Trump administration have decided that America no longer needs to concern itself with world affairs and has abandoned a number of international agreements. These include the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, the Trans-Pacific Partnership which aims to liberalise Asia-Pacific trade, and the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action which sets limits on Iran's nuclear program. President Trump argued that the TPP would be harmful to American manufacturing, in turn reducing employment, lowering wages for local workers, and increasing inequality. The US withdrawal from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action on Iran risks seriously weakening trust and confidence in international arrangements that are essential parts of the global security architecture. By the US pulling out, this further destabilises the world's most volatile region. Not to mention the ongoing US-China trade war that has left many doubts and uncertainties dangling over the global economy. So in conclusion, inequality is growing, the rich are getting richer, governments are ignoring the concerns of their citizens, authoritarianism is rearing its ugly head, and people are getting angry. What's in store for 2020? Time will tell, I suppose, but I can't imagine it's going to be very good. Mm -hmm.